My name's Mark Littlewood. I'm the Director General here at the Institute of Economic Affairs and your host this evening for this panel discussion on the future of the BBC and its funding. Uh, with the BBC's charter up for review next year, uh, this is obviously going to be a hot political discussion. I think it's become hotter more recently in recent days, actually, than we anticipated when we initially scheduled this debate. Um, uh, the IEA doesn't take a corporate position on any particular area of policy, uh, but it's fair to say that uh, IEA scholars, staff and spokespeople have probably been critical of the present BBC funding model and have suggested new ways in which we might uh, finance the BBC in future. Um, but of course, uh, the uh, Select Committee for Culture, Media and Sport has recently proposed that we might replace the licence fee with a compulsory levy by household rather than by uh, the purchase of a product or by a subscription model or something similar. So what is the future for um, our, our state broadcaster, the BBC? Uh, how should we fund it and how might broadcasting change in Britain in the years to come? We have a superb panel to consider these points uh, and to put forward their views on this and I'm going to ask each of them to share five minutes worth, preferably no more, because this is such an extensive panel of their thoughts with us before we have Q&A and a discussion. Uh, and despite the fact that my thoughts of this are uh, very much in the public domain, I'm going to try and be as neutral a chairman as I possibly can be for the rest of this evening. Let me um, introduce you to our panel from my uh, far right uh, uh, to my near right, which is indeed the order in which they're going to speak. It's not often I describe somebody from the BBC as being on my far right, actually. Um, but uh, I'm delighted that James Heath, Director of Policy and Charter for the BBC, is here to join us. He oversees public policy development and regulatory affairs. Uh, next to James is Janet Daly, political economist for the Sunday Telegraph. I particularly enjoyed Janet's uh, column this weekend on what the hell is this general election about, which showed a particular honesty for a political commentator, but definitely rang true with me. Um, she's also regularly on our, um, uh, on our television screens as one of the uh, leading commentators in Britain. Thirdly, we'll hear from Sir Simon Jenkins. Simon's a journalist and author, writes for The Guardian, and is also uh, an eminent broadcaster. Next is Tim Condon, Chief Executive of International Monetary Research and Economic Consultancy, um, former chairman of the Freedom Association, recently published a pamphlet called Privatise the BBC, and in fact a pricey of that pamphlet is in EA Magazine, which I hope is on all of your chairs today. Uh, and Tim has written and spoken frequently on the uh, need to scrap the licence fee. Um, uh, then we have uh, Patrick McIntosh, uh, uh, a supporter of the IEA, a chartered accountant and trustee of the Voice of Viewer and Listener, which aims to safeguard the quality, diversity and editorial integrity of broadcast programmes. And last but not least, we have our very own Dr Steve Davis, our education director here at the IEA. He's authored several books, including Empiricism and History, and has been co-editor of the Dictionary and cons uh, of Conservative and Libertarian Thought. We're grateful to all of you for giving up your time this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our panel. Uh, I'm going to ask each panellist to speak for five minutes. You can stay in a sedentary position or stand as you wish. Um, I'm not going to be too totalitarian about it, but after... Six minutes, I'll let you know that you've overrun time, and after seven minutes or so, I'll start to shout you down. James, can we start with you? Yeah, so I was, was going to sort of carry on talking <laughs> in terms of avoid the questions. Um, uh, thanks, Mark. I suppose it was, it was with some trepidation that I uh, joined you this evening to sort of debate the future of the BBC here in the sort of UK's first and preeminent sort of free market think tank. Um, but I think, as Mark said, with Charter Review fast approaching, it's important that there's a full and open debate about the BBC and the key questions. Why do you still need the BBC? What should it do? And how must it change for the internet era? I'll start with the BBC today and then say something about the BBC's future. 
I mean, at its simplest, the case for the BBC rests on what we do. We're here to make great programmes and services that inform, educate and entertain. I mean, that's why the public in the main like the BBC. That's why the public in the main trust the BBC. That's why the public in the main value the BBC. I mean, the argument is not made less powerful by being quite simple. And despite huge media growth, the BBC still reaches about 97% of the British public every week. And it's chosen about 150 million times a day. That probably makes us one of the uh, most chosen public services in the UK. I mean, since the beginning of the current charter, back in 2006, the BBC's overall reach has gone up. The public's trust in the BBC has gone up, despite some significant uh, problems and challenges that we've had. And their view of the quality of the BBC has gone up. I mean, that's not to say there have not been problems, but overall, the performance is in reasonably good shape. So the BBC, I'd argue, works in practice, but what about in theory? And I suppose this depends on how you value institutions like the BBC and on the political and arguably sort of moral judgments you make. I mean, for me, it's wrong to see the BBC as a deviation from an idealised sort of market norm. I mean, I see the BBC, and I think a large amount of the population see the BBC, as central to the common culture of the, uh, the country, to the national life, and critically, to central to how the UK broadcasting system, which is world class, works. And there are different ways of, clearly there are different ways of allocating services and goods. It often depends on the purpose and point of the good. And the point of the BBC, is set out in its charter and uh, uh, by Parliament, is to provide content that educate, informs and entertains and to deliver a set of social, cultural and democratic goals. I mean, fundamentally, it seems to me that's why we've collectively decided to fund the BBC publicly and make it universally available to all so far. So what about the future? I, mean, I think that purpose of the BBC will be enduring, but as an organisation we'll need to transform what we do and how we do it if we are to endure. I mean the internet gives us actually some new tools to deliver public service broadcasting in new and better and exciting ways. Um, we started that journey with BBC Online and with iPlayer and that's why we're proposing to move BBC3 from a linear service to online. So the BBC will need to reinvent what public service broadcasting means. It will mean in future live channels and on-demand content. It will mean short-form content, long-form content. It will mean telling stories in new ways, in interactive and immersive ways that take advantage of new technologies. And after the election, as part of Charge Review, we'll set out our plans for how we will do that. I mean, and critically, we want to do it in a way that involves licence fee payers. We want to involve licence fee payers more in what we do, from new programmes to new services, and how we run ourselves. The BBC has been quite a paternalistic organisation, and I think we need to be far more open in how we run and operate. And I'll just, I'll just finish on, on, on funding. I mean, I, again, think the licence fee remains the best way of funding the BBC. It's a universal fee for a universal service. It delivers a huge range of content to audiences at an affordable price. I mean, it's 40p a day per household for an average of six hours BBC consumption per day, per household. And critically, it's the engine of investment in UK original content. I think the BBC now is around 40% of all the investment that takes place in drama, comedy, news, in UK content, yet it's only 22% of revenues. It converts a licence fee effectively into, into UK content. And perhaps that's why twice as many people identify the licence fee as still the best way to fund the BBC versus the alternatives of advertising and subscription. It's something we've been polling for the last 10 years with the same question via Murray. However, we've always said that the licence fee should be updated. It needs to be updated. It was updated from radio to TV, then from black and white TV to colour TV, and most recently from uh, TV to all types of devices. And we think that needs to happen again. And we welcome the Select Committee's uh, ideas around how modernisation needs to happen. There are a range of ideas and there needs to be debate on them. And I'll, I'll stop there. Joes, thank you very much indeed. Janet. In order to appreciate the rather absurd, anomalous nature of the BBC in the present broadcasting market, the present broadcasting context, you'd have to imagine a town which had a branch of Tesco and a branch of Sainsbury's and maybe a branch of Waitrose and the usual array of independent greengrocers and so on. But in the middle of the town, there is a humongous 
enormous organization, 10 times the resources, 10 times the size and space of any of those other outlets. And it's the public service food provider. And it doesn't charge anything for its wares, it gives them away. Because it's subsidized by a fridge license, which everybody, every household that owns a fridge has to have unless they can prove to the authorities they don't own a fridge, which is really quite difficult to prove a negative. So this food provider, which is subsidized by effectively a poll tax on every household, not only does it provide all its goods for free to anyone who comes through the door, but every time one of its potential commercial competitors comes up with some innovative idea to attract customers, you know, a delicatessen counter or shoots for a shellfish bar, the, B the, the BBC, the food provider says, oh, we can do that, we'll do that too, and we'll do it for free. So whether it's a news website or uh, an on-demand film service or whatever the competitor thinks of as a possible attraction for custom, the BBC will match and it will do it for free. And it will use that matching of whatever is going to justify increasing the fridge license. Now that seems to me a situation that one would never envisage happening at this point. If we were starting from this point, that would just be so ridiculous. It's anomalous on about three different levels. It completely ignores the fact that it's distorting a commercial market, which now exists. There is a considerable broadcasting market. Many, many commercial providers, which have to charge for their wares. Um, it charges a, li a license fee for a piece of domestic equipment, which is like a throwback to the Soviet Union. We had a communist Romania, you had to have a license to own a typewriter. The idea that you would then extend that necessity to have a license fee to all kinds of other outlets on which you can receive broadcasting. You know, everyone who has a computer, everyone who has a tablet, everyone who has a mobile phone potentially will have to become eligible to pay this license fee because now there are so many other ways of accessing apart from televisions. Um, the BBC constantly invents new things. I mean, the original remit to entertain and to inform and to educate is long past. That ship sailed a long time ago. What the BBC, the BBC is now offering courses in computer coding. It's now gone into partnership with the DWP to offer apprenticeships. It's practically become an extension of a department of government. It's now, in effect, I, I'm surprised every day when I discover that it isn't selling insurance. You know, it's doing every conceivable <laughs> climb, <laughs> climbing onto every conceivable platform, every new possible outlet, and offering up free, dumping free content onto that market. The BBC News website employs far more people and uses far more resources than any newspaper website could possibly manage. So it's very, very difficult for all the independent news websites to compete with the BBC News website. And in addition to that, when you access the BBC News, web news website from outside the country, it has adverts on it. So it's competing for advertising outside of this country. And the BBC's answer to this is to do even more, because to justify a universal poll tax or license fee, you have to say we're serving everybody, we're serving every conceivable broadcasting desire. Everyone in the country, ha as, as my friend here said, everyone has to access the BBC at some time or another in order to justify the universal fee. What they should be saying, if they is really thinking very seriously about the idea of public service broadcasting and reducing what they're doing, not replicating every conceivable bit of sort of junk television or mass broadcasting, but doing only what would really constitute public service broadcasting, which no commercial organization would offer. That's the future for the BBC. Thank you. Simon. Right. Um, <laughs> I, I, I sense we're going pro anti pro anti. I'm going to be very careful what I say. Um, uh, I've worked for the BBC off and on all my life, but never for it. Um, but I have learned that one way to get um, onto any BBC programme you want to get onto is to publicly attack the management of the BBC. The staff love it. <laughs> They'll have you straight round and tell you what the truth is. Um, the, um, the, I wouldn't like to live in a Britain which just didn't have the BBC, more or less as it performs at the moment. Um, most of the things it does, it does really quite well. Uh, and um, I, we can get so obsessed with the things it, 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 it cocks up 
um, to, to, to forget just how bloody good much of it is. Uh, I, I'm not a vast consumer of the BBC, but I, I, I listen to Radio 4 a lot. Um, I think BBC 4 is terrific. I think all kinds of things are, are sort of aimed at me, and I'm very happy with them. They're more or less good. I also believe um, very strongly in the integrity of a news organization. And a news organization has to, be, um, has to have certain qualities to it. One of them, it has to have money uh, independent of, uh, of, of, of um, what might be called the government of the day, independent of power. Um, and the BBC does to that extent. Uh, it needs to be of a certain size. It can offer its staff a measure of security um, from being fired because they've made a mistake. Um, again, the BBC does that. Um, I also think, I have to say, that there's something to be said for it being slightly left-wing. I know I'm saying this in the wrong building. Um, but um, but uh, I, and I, don't, I very rarely agree with the BBC's conventional wisdom, I may say. But I do think that being slightly anti-establishment for a body which is so establishment is really quite a good thing. Uh, these are largely fortuitous uh, happenings. The BBC has come out that way after half a century of, of, of trial and error. Um, and it's not terribly bad at them. Uh, that is what I regard as the good thing about the BBC. The anti is very clear, and it's been stated very well by Janet and, and by Tim in his paper. Um, uh, it is fat, bureaucratic, absurdly resistant to changing its internal procedures. Um, uh, the, 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 this business of the ever-expanding middle management tier uh, is exactly what happens. There's nothing like a left-wing organization to behave just like the worst sort of capitalist organization. It just endlessly increases its overhead, and that's what the BBC has been doing. Now, when I, when I sort of posit what might be called the, 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 the thesis and the antithesis, um, I think almost everybody who discusses the BBC never gets around to the synthesis. Um, what is it they really want to see? Uh, I want to see the BBC go on. I really do. Oh, sorry, I want to see a BBC go on. I don't want to live in a country with no public service broadcaster. Uh, the American PBS is a mess. Most of the continental ones don't work anything like as well as the BBC does. So broadly speaking, I want some other BBC to survive. Do I want this BBC to survive? I'm not sure I do. And this is, the, this is the real issue. Um, and it does relate to the licence fee, because the licence fee is, is, is basically the, 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 the blood flow into the BBC. Um, it, is, it is simply too big, but I don't want to cut it too much. I don't want to damage the BBC uh, in its best features. Um, I've, I've struggled long over subscription, and I'm finally in favour of subscription. I think subscription is not the end of the world for the BBC. I just don't. Um, everybody's now used to ticking that skybox. Uh, which are the bits you want? Um, and I do think, such as the public support for the BBC, that most people would tick most of the boxes. I don't think it would mean the BBC would lose huge amounts of, of, of revenue. Um, I think it could do with losing a bit of revenue. Uh, I have no problem with a certain amount of advertising on the BBC. It is full of placements, we know. Um, the, the breaks in BBC One now are almost as long as the breaks in ITV. Um, I just haven't got a problem with that sort of advertising. But I wouldn't want to see it on the radio. I just wouldn't fastidious about these things. Um, so what I'm really saying is I don't think it's impossible to invent a model for the BBC finances that maintains the, the integrity of the organisation, maintains the quality of its output, um, forces it to slim down, forces it to behave more like um, a, 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 a proper media organisation and less like a government department. And at the end of the day, gives us what we originally did have um, and I think you know, we'll, we'll continue to want to have as the market changes, which is a broadcasting organisation, not an internet organisation. I'm right with Janet on this. Um, it is outrageous, some of the things the BBC has been doing on the internet. Um, but a broadcasting organisation um, funded not by the government and not by uh, the advertiser, but by the users of that service. That's the ideal. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, well... There was a time when I would have been in favour of a licence fee, um, also in favour of state ownership um, of the BBC, and that was when these things began um, in the 1940s. Um, but things have moved on. on. Um, in those days, there was only really one technological possibility of um, we had one, one channel, uh, and there's no way of paying directly for programmes. So the only way of doing it, other than having some tax revenue, was a license fee. We then, in the 1950s, uh, had uh, independent television, so the monopoly became a duopoly. And then over the last 30, 40 years, uh, more channels have come on to um, the um, televisions as such. Uh, so we've gone from monopoly to duopoly to oligopoly. And um, there's payment by subscription, Sky, mixture of subscription and advertising and so on. But actually what's happening now is that um, you can watch television effectively 
um, on computers and indeed on mobile phones. And is it proposed that the license fee be paid on computers? Well, in fact, legally, that is the position. Um, but actually, I think the people who think about these subjects realize that having a, a license fee on mobile phones is getting a bit silly. And in this sense, the license fee tax base is no longer makes any sense. And as broadcasting goes international, then the whole idea of a national license fee also breaks down. So it seems to me very clear that the license fee has to go in the end. And it appears also, practically everybody accepts that sooner or later. Um, actually, the idea of household tax I just find so appalling for the kind of reasons that Janet's just explained. You could, I suppose, and Simon seems to be suggesting, that you have subscription um, for a publicly owned organisation. With respect, the BBC is already a very challenged organisation. Sky has more revenue in this country, from this country, than the BBC, and it's growing faster. Uh, the attractions of the BBC for young people, as for its career, are diminishing. And uh, the BBC has huge problems looking ahead, even with a stable license fee. We're living in the 21st century. I want the BBC to survive. In some ways, it's an admirable institution. It's done some good things, certainly in the past. Uh, and I th I'd like it to be a world beater. I want it to compete in the world as a whole, um, compete even, say, with Google. Google has revenues of $70 billion. All right. uh, you know, I think it's a shame the BBC wasn't privatized 15 or 20 years ago, and perhaps it would now be in that kind of space. It isn't anywhere near there. And basically, I'm sorry to say this, Sir Simon, but it's in very serious relative decline. The only way the BBC is going to survive is if its license fee goes, and if it's privatized, and it becomes competing in this space of media, telephone companies, and so on, on a global basis. Otherwise, it'll go the way of British shipbuilders and British Leyland. And I'm sorry about that, but that's <laughs> the way it'll go. OK, I'm going to come at this from a slightly uh, different perspective. Um, I'm a great supporter of the IEA, and I'm also a supporter of small government. But it seems to me that the only way uh, that we uh, can achieve small government is through world-class education. And I'm going to talk about public service broadcasting as opposed to the BBC, because it seems to me that public service broadcasting is our primary source of reasonably unfettered information and to all social groups. I joined the VLV, um, the voice of the listener and the viewer, simply because I was so appalled by the debacle of the last license review, which even um, John Whittingdale in this room suggested was appallingly mishandled. Um, the VLV is not about um, putting up license fees. It's simply about having a proper debate. And one of the things that concerns me is whether any political party is going to have any observation in their manifesto coming up to this election about what they will propose for the license review and also for charter renewal. Um, the uh, public service broadcasting in this country is providing to our creative industries, part of our creative industry, about 76 billion per annum of UK economy. It's about 5% of our UK economy. We export about 17.3 billion through creative industry. Some of that must come out of the fact that we have a world-class public service broadcasting. We employ about 1.7 million people through creative industry. Again, a lot of that must come through public service broadcasting. But let me give you a, a personal anecdote. I walked to the South Pole this uh, January to raise awareness about cancer, early diagnosis, eating better food, taking more exercise, and how the whole of society can help to support themselves, become less of a drain on the National Health Service, to take responsibility uh, for themselves, etc., etc. About saving tax, about making the, putting the National Health Service back where it should be and not being such a vast drain upon society. I reached about 500 million people. Why? Because it was picked up by local radio, by ITV 
and then eventually through the BBC, etc., etc., suddenly I became a newspaper item. Now, the issue for me was that it wasn't sensational, but it was a good piece to have. And it seemed to me, from my experience, that public service broadcasting picked it up without fear or favour and used it as useful information to put into the public debate. Simon Walker, chief executive of the IOD in the magazine this month, said it would be folly to scrap the licence fee. He reflects upon the debate that we're having now and what happened in New Zealand 30 years ago. And in the end, what's happened in New Zealand is, as he reflects in his article, absolutely appalling. So my point is this. I hope that we don't go the way of the United States. I hope we don't go the way of, United, of New Zealand. There is no example in the world uh, of our type of public service broadcasting. It provides the education we need for small government and it provides public awareness, information and social responsibility. And my view is that if we want to change education, we have got to keep some form of public service broadcasting in and around the shape that we have at the moment. Patrick, thank you. Steve. <coughs> well, thank you. Well, uh, my own view, I'm afraid, is in one sense, all the debate that uh, we've been having here and that's been going on in this country for a long time, going right back to the Peacock report, maybe, uh, is going to be moot fairly soon. Uh, and Tim Nouet has touched on this. The fact is we're undergoing a technological communications revolution right now, uh, which is most obviously the fact that, as we've heard, you can now watch television programmes on a whole range of uh, devices and media, not simply on a television set. And that's obviously deeply problematic for a form of funding which is essentially based on the fact that you could only receive television programmes if you bought and owned a television set. And it was relatively easy and simple to associate a charge with ownership of that particular device. Uh, not so easy when you have things like mobile phones, computers, tablets and the like. There's actually more to that, but first of all, just look at the scale of this phenomenon. Uh, by 2020, according to a recent study, uh, the number of people watching television programmes on televisions will be half of what it is now. Uh, in the 18 months to 2014, uh, television viewing on television between f of people in the age group of 4 to 15 went down by 22%. And in the same period, the television viewing of 16 to 24-year-olds went down by 15%. Now, these are the viewers of the future. They are falling out of the habit of watching television on programmes, that is, on TV. Uh, they're doing something, I would argue, completely different. At the same time, the new technology is also making possible the entry of a whole lot of new organisations and firms into the broadcasting sphere, such as British Telecom, <coughs> maybe Google that Tim mentioned. And this means that the whole model of what broadcasting is, is also being changed by technological change as well as the actual experience of watching it. Now, there's obvious practical problems with this. Uh, you know, the licence fee has been upgraded now so that if you're going to watch live TV uh, or live material anyway on a computer, then you're supposed to pay the licence fee. Uh, according to recent surveys, 43% of the public had no idea that this was the case. Uh, and what that tells you is that this is a simply unenforceable mode of funding. It simply cannot continue. Uh, and there's this proposal to have instead a household-based poll tax, essentially, a broadcasting levy, <coughs> which essentially would amount to being a tax on access to the internet. And I think that that would be, A, politically impossible, and really actually quite damaging for the BBC and against its own interests because it would destroy a huge amount of the uh, goodwill which I think it still has amongst many parts of the British public uh, as well as not actually solving the uh, increasingly acute problems of funding and other things which it faces. Uh, and so I don't think that there are any easy or straightforward ways of keeping Humpty Dumpty as we have him at the moment together uh, and not having him fall off the wall. But it seems to me that the real question, which in a way lies at the background of what the people on my right here have all been saying, uh, as well as this technological revolution, is the question, well, OK, what is public service broadcasting? Because there does seem to be an agreement, it seems to me, that there should be such a thing. But the question of what it is that makes broadcasting, public service broadcasting, it seems to me, isn't clearly spelled out. 
Some people would appear to say that it's to do with the content, uh, that essentially public service broadcasting is defined by its having a content in terms of programming that would not or could not be provided by a commercial uh, provider. Uh, I doubt that that is actually true any longer with uh, the advent of uh, ways of charge collecting subscriptions and things uh, for people, from people, and barring access to the uh, the good provided that way to other people. Uh, some people would seem to say that public service broadcasting is defined by the funding, but in that case I would argue uh, it's not going to survive. Uh, other people would imply that it's about the way in which it's done, the style or the format. This seems to be Patrick's uh, perspective here uh, right next to me. And again, I, see, I don't see how that necessitates, if you want that kind of broadcasting, the kind of funding model uh, or special legal status that the BBC has. And finally, a very common notion uh, is that it's to do with a common experience. Now, that is not the same thing as uh, content, because apparently the common experience was things like watching the FA Cup final together as a whole nation, and no doubt all of us singing Abide With Me in the living room while we did it, or something like that. Um, and the point I would say is that, certainly for that last thing, and for several of the other ways, uh, the whole change that we're going through is, trans is transformative, and it means that the very question of what public sector public service broadcasting is and whether we can or should have it is now up for debate because I think that the experience of watching television programmes is quite different now to what it was before. It's no longer the kind of shared uh, experience that it used to be where a whole lot of people watch the same programme in real time. People now watch programmes at different times. Uh, it's much more like watching a, reading a book or watching a uh, film which maybe other people have seen at other times. And the water cooler conversations, as the Americans call them, are no longer about what did you see on the uh, major soap opera or anything of that sort. They're about what you've seen on Netflix or something that people uh, have begun to watch on the much more fragmented and individual choice driven media uh, that we have today. And so I think we're dealing with a quite different world and we really need to think very uh, deeply about what indeed public service broadcasting can or should mean in this kind of context and whether in fact it's either possible or even perhaps desirable that we should have uh, such a thing anymore. And I personally think actually, just to conclude, uh, that we're coming to the end of a hundred year period which began with uh, Lord Northcliffe and the Daily Mail and then went on to radio and then on to television where we did indeed have a kind of mass uh, standardised experience of media <coughs> consumption. We forget how historically peculiar and contingent that is. And I think that in this, as in many other ways, we're going back to the age before 1900, to a much more variegated, pluralistic, uh, and in many ways complicated, messy, but in all the ways more interesting and creative world. Steve, thank you very much. Thank you to all of our panellists.